Whether through a quick gesture, a spoken word, or the utilization of components, the channeling of magical energies is a process that warrants a full and concise examination. On today's D&D Academy, we're continuing our overview of the rules of magic by covering the casting of spells. Welcome back to D&D Academy. My name is Paul and I'm the Dungeon Master here at House of Crit. In our last episode, we began our discussion with the basics of spellcasting in Dungeons and Dragons. Today, we're going in depth on the actual process of casting a spell. When a character casts any spell, the same basic rules are followed regardless of the character's class or the spell's effects. Each spell description in Chapter 11 of the Player's Handbook begins with a block of information, including the spell's name, level, school of magic, casting time, range, components, and duration. The rest of the spell entry describes the spell's effect. Let's take a look at one of these entries and break it down. Found on page 252 of the Player's Handbook is the spell Identify, which we'll use as our example spell. At the top, you can see that it is a first level divination spell with the ritual tag. If you remember from our last video, this means a first level spell slot needs to be expended in order to cast the spell, or it can be cast as a ritual without expending the spell slot at the cost of taking 10 additional minutes to cast. Divination is the school of magic that the spell is from. The schools of magic help describe spells, but they have no rules of their own although some rules in the game do refer to the schools. Let's break them down real quick to get a feel for the flavor of each of the schools. Abjuration spells are protective in nature, although some of them have aggressive uses. They create magical barriers, negate harmful effects, harm trespassers, or banish creatures to other planes of existence. Conjuration spells involve the transportation of objects and creatures from one location to another. Some spells summon creatures or objects to the caster's side, whereas others allow the caster to teleport to another location. Some conjurations can even create objects or effects out of nothing. Divination spells reveal information, whether in the form of secrets long forgotten, glimpses of the future, the location of hidden things, the truth behind illusions, or visions of distant people or places. Enchantment spells affect the minds of others, influencing or controlling their behavior. Such spells can make enemies see the caster as a friend, force creatures to take a course of action, or even control another creature like a puppet. Evocation spells manipulate magical energy to produce a desired effect. Some create blasts of fire or lightning, Others channel positive energy to heal wounds. Illusion spells deceive the senses or minds of others. They cause people to see things that are not there, to miss things that are there, to hear phantom noises, or to remember things that never happened. Some illusions create phantom images that any creature can see, but the most insidious illusions plant an image directly into the mind of a creature. Necromancy spells manipulate the energies of life and death. Such spells can grant an extra reserve of life force, drain the life energy from another creature, create undead, or even bring the dead back to life. And lastly, transmutation spells change the properties of a creature, object, or environment. They might turn an enemy into a harmless creature, bolster the strength of an ally, make an object move at the caster's command, or enhance a creature's innate healing abilities to rapidly recover from injuries. Now moving on, below the name, level, and school of a spell, we see the casting time, range, components, and duration. A spell's casting time is how long it takes to cast. Most spells require a single action to cast, but some spells require a bonus action, a reaction, or much more time to cast. A spell cast with a bonus action is especially swift you must use a bonus action on your turn to cast the spell, provided that you have not already taken a bonus action on this turn. You also cannot cast another spell during the same turn, except for a cantrip with a casting time of one action. Some spells can be cast as reactions, 
These spells take a fraction of a second to bring about and are cast in response to some event. If a spell can be cast as a reaction, the spell's description tells you exactly when you can do so. Certain spells, including spells cast as rituals, require more time to cast, minutes or even hours. When you cast a spell with a casting time longer than a single action or reaction, you must spend your action each turn casting the spell, and you must maintain your concentration while you do so. We'll talk about concentration in a moment, but if your concentration is broken, the spell fails, but you don't expend a spell slot. If you want to try casting the spell again, however, you must start over. The target of a spell must be within the spell's range. For a spell like Magic Missile, the target is a creature. For a spell like Fireball, the target is a point in space where the ball of fire erupts. Most spells have ranges expressed in feet, some spells can target only a creature, including yourself, that you can touch. Other spells, such as the shield spell, affect only you. These spells have a range of self. Spells that create cones or lines of effect that originate from you also have a range of self, indicating that the origin point of the spell's effect must be you. We'll be covering areas of effect later in this video. Once a spell is cast, its effects aren't limited by its range unless the spell's description says otherwise. A typical spell requires you to pick one or more targets to be affected by the spell's magic. A spell's description tells you whether the spell targets creatures, objects, or a point of origin for an area of effect. Unless a spell has a perceptible effect, a creature might not know it was targeted by a spell at all. An effect like crackling lightning is obvious, but a more subtle effect, such as an attempt to read a creature's thoughts, typically goes unnoticed unless a spell says otherwise. To target something, you must have a clear path to it, so it can't be behind total cover. If you place an area of effect at a point that you can't see and an obstruction, such as a wall, is between you and that point, the point of origin comes into being on the near side of that obstruction. If a spell targets a creature of your choice, you can choose yourself unless the creature must be hostile or specifically a creature other than you. If you are in the area of effect of a spell you cast, you can target yourself. Next up are spell components. A spell's components are the physical requirements you must meet in order to cast it. Each spell's description indicates whether it requires a verbal, V, somatic, S, or material, M, components. If you can't provide one or more of these spell components, you are unable to cast the spell. Let's go over verbal components first. Most spells require the chanting of mystic words. The words themselves aren't the source of the spell's power. Rather, the particular combination of sounds with specific pitch and resonance sets the threads of magic in motion. Thus, a character who is gagged or in an area of silence such as one created by the silent spell, can't cast a spell with a verbal component. Moving on to somatic components, spell casting gestures might include a forceful gesticulation or an intricate set of gestures. If a spell requires a somatic component, the caster must have the free use of at least one hand to perform these gestures. Therefore, a spell caster whose hands are bound are unable to cast spells that have a somatic component. And lastly, casting some spells require particular objects, material components that are specified in the parentheses in the component entry. A character can use a component pouch or a spell casting focus in place of the components specified for a spell. But if a cost is indicated for a component, a character must have that specific component before they can cast the spell. If a spell states that a material component is consumed by the spell. The caster must provide this component for each casting of the spell. A spell caster must have a hand free to access these components, but it can be the same hand that they use to perform somatic components. A spell's duration is the length of time a spell persists. A duration can be expressed in rounds, minutes, hours, or even years. Some spells specify that their effects last until the spells are dispelled or destroyed. Many spells are instantaneous. 
The spell harms, heals, creates, or alters a creature or an object in a way that can't be dispelled because its magic only exists for an instant. Some spells require you to maintain concentration in order to keep their magic active. If you lose concentration, such a spell ends. If a spell must be maintained with concentration, that fact appears in its duration entry, and the spell specifies how long you can concentrate on it. You can end concentration at any time, no action required. Normal activity, such as moving and attacking, does not interfere with concentration. The following factors can break concentration. The first being the casting of another spell that requires concentration. You lose concentration on a spell if you cast another spell that requires concentration. You cannot concentrate on two spells at once. Also, the taking of damage. Whenever you take damage while you are concentrating on a spell, you must make a constitution saving throw to maintain your concentration. The DC equals 10, or half the damage you take, whichever number is higher. If you take damage from multiple sources, such as an arrow and a dragon's breath, you make a separate saving throw for each source of damage. Being incapacitated or killed also breaks concentration. The DM may also decide that certain environmental phenomena, such as a wave crashing over you while you're on a storm-tossed ship, require you to succeed on a DC-10 constitution saving throw to maintain concentration on a spell. One last point on duration to mention is the effects of different spells add together while the durations of these spells overlap. The effects of the same spell cast multiple times does not combine, however. Instead, the most potent effect, such as the highest bonus, from these castings applies when their durations overlap. For instance, if two clerics cast Bless on the same target, that character gains the spell's benefit only once. They don't get to roll two bonus dice, unfortunately. So now, let's talk about areas of effect. Spells, such as Burning Hands and Cone of Cold, cover an area, allowing them to affect multiple creatures at the same time. A spell's description specifies its area of effect, which typically has one of five different shapes cone, cube, cylinder, line, or sphere. Every area of effect has a point of origin, a location from which the spell's energy erupts. The rules for each shape specify how you position its point of origin. Typically, a point of origin is a point in space, but some spells have an area whose origin is a creature or an object. A spell's effect extends in straight lines from the point of origin. If no unblocked straight line extends from the point of origin to a location within the area of effect, that location isn't included in the spell's area. To block one of these imaginary lines, an obstruction must provide total cover. Let's go over these five types of area of effect shapes, starting with cones. A cone extends in a direction you choose from its point of origin. A cone's width at a given point along its length is equal to that point's distance from the point of origin. A cone's area of effect specifies its maximum length. A cone's point of origin is not included in the cone's area of effect unless you decide otherwise. Let's use the spell Burning Hands to illustrate this. You can see here that the spell has a range of self 15 foot cone. This means the spell originates from the caster and ends 15 feet away. The next shape is a cube. You select a cube's point of origin, which lies anywhere on the face of the cubic effect. The cube's size is expressed as the length of each side. A cube's point of origin is not included in the cube's area of effect, unless you decide otherwise. Let's take a look at this using the spell Thunderwave. Thunderwave creates a 15-foot cube with a range of self. This means the caster creates a 15-foot cube anywhere around them. Moving on to cylinders, a cylinder's point of origin is the center of a circle of a particular radius, as given in the spell's description. The circle must either be on the ground or at a height of the spell's effect. The energy in a cylinder expands in straight lines from the point of origin to the perimeter of the circle, forming the base of the cylinder. The spell's effect then shoots up from the base or down from the top to a direction equal to the height of the cylinder. 
a cylinder's point of origin is included in the cylinder's area of effect. A line extends from its point of origin in a straight path up to its length and covers an area defined by its width. A line's point of origin is not included in the line's area of effect unless you decide otherwise. And lastly, spheres. You select a sphere's point of origin and the sphere extends outward from that point. The sphere's size is expressed as a radius in feet that extends from the point. A sphere's point of origin is included in the sphere's area of effect. We're almost finished for today, and the last parts of casting a spell that we're going to cover are saving throws and attack rolls. Many spells specify that a target can make a saving throw to avoid some or all of the spell's effects. The spell specifies the ability that the target uses for the save and what happens on a success or failure. The DC to resist one of your spells equals 8, plus your spell casting ability modifier, plus your proficiency bonus, plus any special modifiers. Other spells require the caster to make an attack roll to determine whether the spell effect hits the intended target. Your attack bonus with a spell attack equals your spell casting ability modifier plus your proficiency bonus. Most spells that require attack rolls involve ranged attacks. Remember that you have disadvantage on an attack roll if you are within five feet of a hostile creature that you can see and that is not incapacitated. And we're done. That covers casting spells. While we covered a lot of things today, keep in mind that each spell in the game has a description of what is needed to cast a spell, as well as what or who it targets, and any rolls needed to be made as a result of the spell. Thank you for joining me today here down in the dungeon, and if this video and the others in this series have helped you, please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons down below and possibly sharing these videos with your gaming groups. This really helps us out, not only growing the channel, but it also helps get more people playing the game we all love. I'll be back next Wednesday with another D&D Academy video where we start getting into the armor, weapons, and equipment found in the game. So I'll see you all back here soon.